I recently finished an individual time trial of the brutally rewarding Arizona Trail 300 race. In today's video, I'm going to share a few things I executed well that you might find helpful, and I'll discuss some embarrassing failures that didn't go exactly to plan. As always, the goal is to inform and aid your planning and get you stoked to embark on adventures of your own. By the way, if you're new to this channel, welcome. I'm Alan, aka Dirty Teeth, and if you've been here before, welcome back. So the AZT 300 was a last minute trip for me, and I jumped at the chance to do it when some stuff fell into place. Especially because it was so cold in Idaho, I was looking forward to warming up in the desert sun. Put a fork in me. I'm done. Patrick from the Bikes or Death podcast, which I highly recommend checking out if you haven't already, was toasting a spring ITT group start with a couple of peeps. I had a narrow work window pop up and it timed out with their departure date perfectly, so my spidey senses went up. Flights for Tucson were cheap, so I pulled the trigger and crammed in as much route prep as I could muster and packed up my bike to make a go of it. Shortly after the flight was underway, the dude next to me passed out hard. I wish I could have done the same, but I was wired. And I found myself being super jealous of the couple across the aisle from me that packed their own Tupperware with a custom granola and fruit concoction that they slowly munched on the whole flight. Why didn't I think of that? Upon arrival in Arizona, I was stoked to see my bike box and I promptly built it up right then and there in the baggage claim area. I didn't need it, but the Tucson airport actually provides a bike stand with some tools and a pump for folks like us. Pretty awesome. And what's even more awesome is when I asked at the info kiosk where the nearest dumpster was so I could dispose of the empty box, the kind woman said, just leave it here and she'll take care of it. How cool is that? Anywho, everything seemed to be intact and was in good working order, and the trip was already off to an unusually smooth start. Maybe too smooth. Next up was a nice little five mile spin in the warm Arizona air to the gas station where I was meeting my carpool buddies for the next leg of the trip. I rode past endless Amazon trucks and huge warehouses that wound up being an Amazon fulfillment center that seemed to never end. And a few minutes later, I arrived at the Circle K. I promptly found some shade to sit and wait, and I met this guy who needed some help. What's your name anyway? Chris, everybody Chris. calls me Porkchop. Good to meet you, Porkchop, Mr. Chris. He lives in the trailer park just behind the gas station, and he had a flat tire on his bike, so I let him use my pump. In return, he told me all the code names of the drugs that get sold around there, and that if I sit there long enough, I'd probably get recruited to sell those drugs. He also shared this clever rhyme he made up while he was in jail about what happens to people when they go on vacation in Tucson. Come on vacation, stay for probation. Go back on violation, stay for the duration. Luckily, right after this, Tim pulled up with Greg and Patrick. Yeah, dude! What's going on? That's right. Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> we threw my bike on the top of his Jeep and started heading south to Sierra Vista. <laughs> Yeah, this is our ride. This is our squad right here. Yeah! Then we got a wheel, some other stuff, and a couple more bikes. Once in Sierra Vista, we met up with another guy, Ian, and had a nice dinner at the local Mexican restaurant before sacking out at the Holiday Inn Express. Tim, I love you, man. <laughs> The following morning, we grabbed some brekkie sandwiches at McDonald's, and Tim took us to the official race start. Barter Monument, 103. yoo -hoo! What's going on? Look at this, Motley Bunch. And just like that, it was time to get busy living or get busy dying. Since my bike was on the roof, it took a while to get everything resituated and dialed in again, so the fellas took off a few minutes ahead of me. A few miles in, I caught up with Patrick. Yeah, buddy. Hey. How you doing, Patrick? Oh, man. Are we, I think we're almost done. <laughs> it's been a great ride. Really enjoyed the scenery. Uh, it's been a beautiful morning, and yeah, I think time to go get a taco and a beer. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Just a couple miles in, starting to gain a little elevation, looking back towards Mexico. Uh, yeah, so far so good, living this dream. Not quite sure where we are, been around for about an hour. Looks like 
Parker Canyon Lake, six miles ahead. First of many gates for me. AZT! <laughs> Here we go. On to the single track. Shortly after passing Patrick and shooting these couple clips, I decided I didn't want to film. I was initially going to make a video of the adventure, kind of like I did for Iditarod or Smoke and Fire, CTR, etc. But the thought of making a video for YouTube just felt stressful, and I really wanted to get lost in the adventure. In hindsight, yeah, maybe I wish I would have documented some more, but I'm also extremely happy with just reveling in the majesty around me and collecting memories that are embedded in my mind. I did share a few fantastic hours of riding and chatting with Greg on that first afternoon. What's up, Greg? <laughs> Where are you at, man? Uh, what is this, Red Bank? Red I think Bank. so. Red Bank tank or something? Red Bank tank with a spigot. Just filled up. Gonna try to make it to Kentucky camp. Uh, had a little tire issue. Ah. Nice little sharp rock, just like <sighs> shot in and I tried to plug it and I couldn't stop it and then Threw a bunch of dirt on it and it held, so. Spitting dirt. Just spitting dirt, right? Sweet, man, look at this. Yep, so. That's where we're going, wild turkeys. Other than a couple hikers, that was pretty much the only interaction I had with another soul on the whole route. I gotta close the windows, my chickens won't be quiet. So I guess that's where I'll transition into the lessons and tips portion of this video. But I will say, the route is gorgeous and challenging, bordering on relentless at times. And it more than lived up to my expectations and is 100% worth every ounce of blood, sweat, and hike -a bike The terrain is varied and rugged and laced with world-class single track and some of the most jaw-dropping desert scenery you can imagine. And if you're not in a time crunch or the 300's not enough riding for you, it's only the southern portion of the full AZT 800 route that takes you all the way north to the border of Utah. This includes disassembling your bike and portaging it on your back for a 20 plus mile hike down to the floor of the Grand Canyon and back up the other side. By the way, Austin Killips recently set a new fastest known time on the full 800 route. I'll be posting an analysis video real soon, diving into the geeky details and power metrics behind that amazing achievement. So if that's up your alley, make sure to hit the subscribe button right now. Anywho, the official 300 route currently posted to ride with GPS lists it at about 315 miles with 35,500 feet of climbing to the race finish at the Picket Post Trailhead near the town of Superior. My Garmin E-Trex has it at just over 40k of elevation gain, which I think is a little high. According to my ride files on Strava, I rode exactly 323.49 miles with 37,000 feet of elevation gain. Although I did dilly-dally off-route a bunch. I'll put links to my Strava files for each day down in the description if you're curious. When the dust settled, I finished my ITT in 3 days, 14 hours, and 38 minutes. This included an official snow detour for a short section at the top of Mount Lemmon, which probably shaved a little off my time. Regardless, my main goal was just to finish the route first and foremost. But I was also loosely aiming for a sub 4 day finish time as well. So I was very happy with the results since I came in almost 10 hours ahead of what I was projecting. Okay, my first tip is don't roll the dice when it comes to water carrying capacity. Early on the first day, basically 20 miles into the route, I lost a water bottle from my fork leg. I lost a water bottle. <laughs> oh no. Uh, it's flopped out somewhere. Oh. But uh, yeah. yeah, all good, homie. All good. Boom. Oh. I know what you're thinking, and I agree 100% rookie move. I've used normal 24 ounce bottles on my fork a zillion times with this exact setup. A tail fin SFM or hose clamps and a salsa Nicholas cage. At the last minute, I switched to one of these big one liter bottles to eke out a little more capacity. Yes, I know I should have secured it with a ski strap, but I decided to roll the dice, thinking if it somehow falls out, I'll definitely notice it. Well, it did and I didn't. Most folks carry at least five to six liters on the AZT and I was already cutting it close by only carrying four and a half liters. So this set me back to three and a half liters of capacity. I wound up backtracking on the techie descent that it bounced out on for a good mile or two. I burned through some time and energy and never found it. So it's a good reminder to you and me to always sweat the little things and save the gambling for Vegas. 
If you're curious, I bought a Gatorade bottle the next day and I kept it in my jersey pocket for the rest of the ride and never skipped a prime opportunity to top off water. In the end, no harm was done, but I am still annoyed that I was such a jabroni. Somewhat on the same topic, I carried Tailwind powder to mix into my water for extra calories and some electrolyte replacement. And I highly recommend this or any similar products. But I messed up in a couple of ways. First, I stored the powder in regular Ziploc bags and shoved them into my feed bag. After a couple days, the friction from all the bumping around wore a hole in one of the bags and I lost a whole sack of powder as it spilled all over the place. Learn from me and use thicker freezer bags and keep it somewhere it won't bounce around so much. Second, I should have brought more options for sodium replacement. In the Arizona heat, it doesn't matter how many crushed Fritos or salty snacks or mustard packets you slurp, there always comes a time when you're not replacing enough sodium, especially if you're a salty heavy sweater like me. In addition to Tailwind, I should have also carried electrolyte tablets that dissolve in water, but more importantly, salt pills as well. The more options to catch up on losses, the better. I wound up riding a good half hour each way off route in the heat of the day to get to a grocery store in Tucson so I could grab some electrolyte pills. Sure, those wound up making me gag sometimes, which is a whole nother story, but the moral is multiple options is never a bad thing. I know I was getting a bit of heat sickness in the hottest parts of the day, especially on the last day before climbing away from the Gila River. I ordered a calzone from the pizza joint in Kelvin that delivers to the A. Spigot. I can't remember the name offhand, uh, and I also got two two-liter bottles of Pepsi as well. I drank one on the spot and then diluted the other one about 50-50 with water and filled my bladder. This is the only thing that barely kept me going until the rainwater collector at the top of the climb. I have no shame in filling my hydration pack with soda, and if you're worried about it getting sticky and all that, I just throw one of those fizzy cleaning tabs in my hydration bladder at the end of every adventure, shake it up, pour it out, clean it, all good. The next tip has to do with navigation, but also relates to hydration and resupply. It's worth paying for and downloading the Far Out app to your phone. It used to be called Gut Hooks. I don't know where they came up with that name, but it's now Far Out, and it's the official trail guide app of the Arizona Trail, along with many others, like the Appalachian Trail and the Colorado Trail, just to name a couple. It's primarily designed for hikers, but you can download the bike route for the AZT. Although it varies slightly from the race route in some parts, so you need to beware. Hikers continually post reliable updates on water sources and various caches, so you can get an idea of what creeks are flowing, which spigots are turned on, or if a specific cache is stocked up, etc. It also offers info on nearby towns and resupply spots, so it comes in very handy dandy. The AZT is a hiking trail first and foremost, and for that reason, much of it is simply too steep and or technical to ride. Therefore, shoes that are comfy enough to hike in all day long are critical to keeping your feet happy and having a successful time on the route. Do not use new cycling shoes that haven't been broken in completely before the event. I used these exact same physique lace-up shoes I took on the CTR because they're so comfy and they still have life left and they were perfecto. Never a blister or any discomfort, and I highly recommend them. But I did mess up one thing for those of us that ride clipless. I neglected to install new cleats a couple weeks out, which is my normal protocol. Because my cleats were old and worn out, they'd randomly disengage and my feet would slip off the pedals at the most inopportune times. Super annoying, so yeah, don't forget new cleats. This is completely random, but always do a quick dummy check before leaving any hotel room. This is especially important when you're diminished and not firing on all cylinders, and it's common sense, I know. But one time on the Stagecoach 400, I left my cues on top of the toilet the morning of the race. And on the morning of starting the AZT, we got up early and rushed out of the room and I left my snazzy little low-profile two-port charger plugged into the wall. This forced some unnecessary stress and worry at the last minute. We had to stop by the 7-Eleven, and I wasted 50 bucks to replace the charger and phone cable. This all could have easily been avoided by taking 30 seconds to peep around the room and under the bed before leaving. Another dummy move I made was neglecting sunblock on the back of my legs. I'll often wear leg coolers, or what Perlazumi calls sun legs, to keep my legs protected from the sun. But for reasons I don't even really remember, I chose not to on this ride. Without sun legs or sunscreen, the back of my calves and the area behind my knees got scorched, and by the time I tried to fix it, the damage was done. 
The skin started peeling, and the second and third day were very uncomfortable. Not a ride ender, but another unnecessary annoyance. And at the risk of sounding like an overprotective parent, either use sunblock liberally or cover all your skin. Obviously, this is good for you anyway in the long term, but also in the short term. I never really spent much time worrying about time splits in the past. I usually just free ball it, and I have a pretty decent idea of my own flow and pace. But this go round, I studied track leaders' archives to make some objective ballpark guesstimates, and it was well worth the effort. It helped me gauge how much food and water I'd need for certain strenuous sections, and calibrate time projections for the hard stretches as well. If you have a general idea of your speed, it's easy to see where other people with similar paces have historically slept or hit critical resupplies and all that. For me, I calculated some splits based on a moving average of six miles an hour and a rough finish time of three days and 16 hours to four days. It worked great. I was able to hit all the resupplies during business hours and nothing along the route jumped out and surprised me. I was mentally prepared for the tough and time-consuming sections like Oracle Ridge and always had plenty of food and water. Yes, mileage and elevation profiles are great, don't get me wrong, but factoring splits alongside this data gives you some added insight and therefore more accurate expectations. I find committing to a sleep strategy ahead of time also helps with creating accurate and achievable time guidelines and goals. On the AZT, I aimed for at least four hours of hopefully decent quality sleep each night, and that's definitely my sweet spot for rides of this length. For me, four hours tends to be just enough rest to get some worthwhile recovery and still enjoy my time on the bike without being completely shelled and punch drunk throughout the whole journey. If I get less than this for more than a couple nights in a row, then I wind up being in full zombie, sleep-deprived mode, and the fun factor dips way too low for my liking. Notice I focused on the word quality. Four hours of restlessly shivering in an emergency bivy doesn't count as quality sleep to me. Especially since the AZT300 doesn't really have any motels on route to get sound sleep in a real bed, carrying a comfy sleep kit is extra important. I didn't carry a sleeping pad, and I haven't in a long while. I had no problem finding soft, flat ground and sandy washes to sleep on. I'm a side sleeper, and I take off my shorts and use the chamois for a hip pad, since that's a bony area that sometimes bugs me. I have a warm down quilt, and I always use a nice blow-up pillow. Yes, you can use a jacket or a pile of clothes or whatever else, but a legit pillow that supports my neck and head properly is a game changer for me. Luckily on the AZT, I never needed to use my bivy because it was so warm and there wasn't any rain. So I just laid it out as a ground cloth under my quilt, set my phone alarm for three and a half to four hours, and dozed off each night while staring up at the stars. I want to take a quick sec to touch on training. In the months before the AZT, I honestly hadn't ridden outside much. Other than JP's Fat Pursuit race and a few fat bike rides on snow here and there, I'd mostly been exercising on my indoor trainer with the Trainer Road app. By the way, I have a few videos going more in depth on fitness gains due to structured training. If you want to check those out, I've got links below. In fact, other than a single hour-long shakedown ride just before boxing up my bike, I hadn't ridden my full suspension mountain bike for almost eight months since I last used it on the Colorado Trail Race. Shh, don't tell anyone. I was worried my technical skills would be super rusty, but within a few hours, I was cruising through the chonk and my confidence in sketchy terrain was back. And as far as fitness goes, I felt stronger than I can remember, and the power data and progression I've been making with structured training supports that as well. I guess the moral is don't hate on indoor training for bikepacking. It's efficient and it works. Sure, it's not as fun as riding outside, but it's definitely worth mixing into your program especially if you're time crunched and you want to get the most fitness bang for your buck. As I'm posting this video, I'm getting ready to tackle the Colorado Trail again. I've been doing my shorter high intensity interval workouts inside and doing my longer fun rides outside. This seems to be a good balance for me. As I mentioned, the heat really affected me on the AZT. Coming from a cold winter and spring in Idaho, the Arizona weather was a bit shocking to my system, and in hindsight, I don't know why I didn't incorporate some heat training along with my indoor riding program as well. Just by turning off the fans and wearing a bunch of clothes, you can raise your core temperature, and doing half hour or 45 minute sessions like this a few days a week on top of your regular training is enough to increase your sweat rate and plasma volume to help you prep for hot weather. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. 
Because of the heat, daytime siestas and lots of night riding can be key on the AZT. No matter how acclimated you become to the heat, it still drains your energy and saps your power output and riding efficiency. So sometimes it's best to take breaks and nap in the shade during the day and use every opportunity to wet your head and neck and soak your core. Then spend more time riding through the night when the temps are manageable and your body's delivering better bang for the buck. Just to make sure you have a dialed lighting setup. A piece of gear that I've recently grown very fond of is a simple heart rate monitor. I know it's annoying to wear and the thought of strapping one on for any ride, much less a multi-day bikepacking trip, isn't all that enticing. But I'm telling you, don't knock it. I used one on Fat Pursuit and the AZT and I'm sold. It helps keep my perceived effort in check and reminds me when I need to back off the throttle <laughs> or if I'm just being a lazy bone and can easily push a little harder and go a little faster without getting overcooked. I find my output is more consistent and keeping it in zone two as much as possible equates to riding stronger for longer. It's especially useful at altitude and in high heat when your heart rate starts to creep and increase without you knowing and you can adjust your output as necessary. And yes, I am even considering adding a power meter to the mix to further regulate my efforts. Many of the top bikepacking racers these days are using power meters and I think it's becoming the norm and not the exception at the pointy end of the pack. I've got videos in the pipeline analyzing the recent FKTs on the Tour Divide, Highland Trail 550, like I mentioned the Arizona Trail 800, and more. They'll be similar to the deep dive I made in the Lachlan's Divide ride, so make sure you're subscribed if you want to get nerdy. Anyway, all those riders are using power meters for those events, and I also see definite benefits for us slower folks. No, it doesn't have to be so we can flex on Strava with the insane wattages we're putting out, but more just to keep tabs on our effort and the energy expenditures. Sure, perceived exertion and simply listening to your body is a great guide, but for me on longer events and rides, my perceptions tend to get skewed and objective data helps a bunch. I hope to hear some of your thoughts on the topic in the comments. The note that I want to end on is no matter how well you've prepped and planned, it's guaranteed that something will go wrong on every bikepacking adventure. So preparing to adapt and overcome any mishap needs to be part of your strategy. You've heard me quote Mike Tyson in many other videos. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. So be ready to get punched in the face. And don't just be ready for it, embrace it. Because dealing with adversity is part of the fun and the beauty of bikepack racing. And having this type of mindset can easily be the difference between finishing and scratching. So smile and suck it up buttercup because we are so blessed to be riding bikes, don't forget it. So that's it. Some pretty random stuff that I hope can help you through your next bikepacking race or ride. I know I'm going to do my best to build on the successful aspects and not repeat the failures. If you have any questions at all, please leave them down in the comment section. Likewise, if you have any tips or wisdom gained from your experiences on the Arizona Trail or any other similar routes, please don't hold back. Share it with us so we can all learn together. If you enjoyed this video, please post it on Facebook and social media so we can reach more folks and click the like button while you're at it. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already. It really means a lot to my little channel. And until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward.